God do some good things in your life this week? Amen. God is faithful, and uh, uh, since the beginning of the year, we have been answering the question, where are you going, and we're looking at different characters, and uh, we talked about the whole idea of maybe some of us were like Jonah and going the wrong way and how we need to turn that whole thing around. We talked about the fact that sometimes we're like Abraham. Sometimes we're like, I just don't know exactly where I'm going, but I believe that God has his hand upon my life and he's called me to make a difference in my world. And so I'm just following him. We talked about Joshua and how like with the children of Israel, occasionally it's kind of like seems like I'm just going around in circles and recognizing that in the midst of that, we need to just keep holding on to Jesus and believing that God is faithful to fulfill his word. We talked about David and that there are times in life when we just need to simply go to the fight and by faith attack the powers of darkness and believe God for the victory. Amen? Amen. Last week we talked about us, ourselves. We talked about the whole idea that our, the goal is that we would get to heaven and, and getting to heaven means that we have reached our ultimate aim, our ultimate goal and that is where God is. One of the things that I have wanted to get you to get in your spirit, get in your heart, want it to sink deep down on the inside so it's just part of the fabric, as it were, your DNA is found in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And so I'm going to just look at it again today, and maybe you could just, just share it in your mind or your, speak it out. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. God is directing our lives. Our goal is that God would lead us. And in leading us, he would bring blessing into our lives as well as make us a blessing to the world around us. And today, I want to spend some time talking to you about the subject of magnifying opportunities, things that come into our life, opportunities that, that arise among us and how we can magnify those opportunities because you're going to be going in life and sometimes it seems like, yeah, I'm going around in circles, but I know ultimately God's going to bring down the walls and I am going to see God's victory in my life. Amen? I may be going, I don't know exactly where I'm going, but I know that God has his hand in my life and I'm going this way. Whatever my hand finds to do, I'm going to do it with all my might. And I believe that God's going to be glorified. And in the midst of that, there are going to be opportunities that are going to arise that I need to know how to magnify those opportunities. Before we jump in, I want to bring something to your attention that we talk about from time to time, something that I think that you need to understand, and most of you already do, but I want to make sure that, that it's something that is in your heart or in your thinking as we're talking about magnifying the opportunities. Jesus says this, and we quote it from time to time out of the Gospel of John, John chapter 10, verse 10. I'm reading the NIV reader's version partly because I just like the way it's rendered. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they can have life. I want them to have it in the fullest possible way. I want them to have life and more abundantly, if you're reading maybe King James or you so different rendering of that particular text. But Jesus' emphasis is that his desire is that we would have life, that we would have it in the fullest possible way. But in the process of that, we need to understand that there is an enemy that we confront. Paul talks about him in the book of Ephesians, of the fact that we have an enemy who wants to come and steal, steal our dreams, steal our vision, steal our purpose, steal our focus, steal our salvation, steal our life. Kill our dream, kill our ministry, kill our life, and destroy us. We have and live in a world in which the enemy is not our friend. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. And because he sits at the right hand of the throne, interceding the new covenant for us, we can have hope. But in the process of running down, chasing down our dream, we need to realize that we're going to be confronted by the enemy who is going to try to rob us. But at the same time, I want this to sink into your heart, sink into your spirit. Psalmist says it this way in Psalm chapter 60, verse 12. New Living Translations says, with God's help, we will do mighty things. One day I'll be like, with God's help, if you're reading another version, you shall do valiantly. We should do mighty things. With God's help, we're going to make a difference in the world in which we live. With God's help, we're going to see the kingdom come and his will be done. I'll be like, ah. we 
with God's help, we can do mighty things because he's the one who will trample down our foes or our enemies. How many know that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How many know that Jesus said that if you ask, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So let's ask God to empower us with his spirit. There was a, there's a story of a young man who wanted to marry the, father's, or the farmer's daughter. She went to the farmer and asked the farmer for the permission to, to marry his daughter. So the farmer looked him up and down and he said, Okay, I want you to go out and I want you to stand out in the pasture out there. And I'm going to release three bulls from the barn. And if you can catch the tail of any one of those bulls, you can have my, wa- my daughter for your wife. So the guy goes out into the pasture, and he's standing there. He's looking towards the barn, and all of a sudden, the barn door opens, and, and he looks and sees the most fierce bull he's ever seen in his life. And he thought, surely, surely, the next one's got to be better. So he kind of got out of the way, and the bull rushing through the, the pasture, and he ended out the back gate. And so he's standing there waiting for the next bull. The door opens, and to his amazement, it's the most, the most crazy bull he's ever see, he's seen in his life, and it's snorting and stra- the, scratching at the ground, looking at him, just kind of like slobbering. Ha! He's like, man, it's got to be something better. So he lets it run by, and so he's thinking, okay, and then the door opens again, and he begins to smile because this is the scrawniest bull he's ever seen in his life. He's thinking, yeah. So the bull comes running, and he's timing it just right, and he reaches out, and lo and behold, there's no tail. (laughs) How many know the last thing you want to do in life is miss the opportunity? God wants us to seize the opportunities that he places in our life, because our goal is is that in every opportunity, we would be able to magnify the Lord. We will be able to be a light so that Jesus' light, life, his message, his mercy can shine out of us. Paul says this way, Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. The Weymouth's New Testament says it this way, buy up your opportunities. So I want to talk about the whole idea of magnifying the opportunities that arise in your life so that we could be a witness to our world. Would you pray with me? God, thank you uh, that we could be here today. Thanks for all the folks that braved the weather. Thanks for keeping them safe and uh, pray in Jesus' name that uh, you bless them. I know there's uh, a number of people watching live stream, Lord, because of the weather and didn't want to get out. Would you just pour out your spirit? God, just right now in their home, in this place, manifest your presence. Help us, Lord, to take in the word. Let our heart be open and be fertile soil so the seed of the word could come in and take root. So that you could be glorified and we could be changed. Because God, we want to make the most of every opportunity. We want to magnify the opportunities you place in our life. We ask in Jesus' name. Yeah, we say amen. So what am I going to need? What are some things that, that, are, that are kind of like required or maybe that, that need to be kind of in your life if you're going to magnify the opportunities? One of the things that I think is very important is that you have to have perception. Perception is defined as a quick acute and intuitive cognitive or capacity for comprehension. In other words, you have to be able to see the opportunity. Because if you can't perceive that God has placed something in your life, you're going to end up like the guy with the bull and miss that opportunity. And so you need to be able to see that opportunity. There's a, uh, there's a guy named George Demestrel. 
He and his dog were out walking in the woods, and they got back from the woods, and they were covered in these burrs, and the, the, the burrs were matted into the, the dog's fur and on his clothes, and so as you perhaps have had maybe your experience, it took him a while to get them all picked off of his clothes and out of his dog's coat. Later on that day, he thought, you know what? He was an engineer, and so he thought, you know what? I wonder what makes those things really stick. And so he looked at them under a microscope, saw that each one of them had these really uh, tiny little hooks on them, and he got this idea. He thought, you know what? What would happen if I could create a material that has a whole bunch of hooks and another material that has a whole bunch of these kind of loops that could be utilized as kind of like a fastener, maybe something like a zipper? He, he, he shared his idea with his friends, and his friends said, dude, I mean, this is not exactly version because they probably didn't use dude back then. This is a foolhardy idea. You're crazy. It's never going to be accepted. But he thought it was a, had merit. And so he decided to put it all together. And he made a prototype. After seven years, he ended up with that particular patent. And most of you know it as Velcro. How many go, thank God for Velcro. The point that I want to make is that a number of people, if you've been out in the woods at all, I was raised in the country, so burrs were kind of like a, my grandma always used to tell me, well, we used to use those to actually make the chairs for our, our doll houses and stuff like that during the Depression. And then thinking, use it as a toy? I think it's a weed. In other words, we often see that and look at that as some kind of a difficulty, something to be avoided. What he saw was an opportunity. What I want us to recognize is that we have to be able to have that perception. Last, a couple of weeks ago when I talked about David, we talked about the fact that David took uh, the, he went to the fight. We, from time to time, have to go to the fight. But David illustrates, I believe, this whole kind of concept in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 24 through 26. So let me just read it with you. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, talking about Goliath, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and will give his, him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. How many of you think, praise God, exemption from taxes? I'm surprised it wasn't like, oh, praise God. Because, you know, it's tax season. How many had their taxes done already? Some of you. Some of you are like, no, don't bring it up. And David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What everyone else saw as an impossibility, David saw as an opportunity. David could see it as an opportunity because he had the perception to be able to recognize that this is an opportunity by which God can be glorified. And I'm just saying to us that we have to be able to see those kinds of opportunities. Remember years and years ago, I, our, our first pastor was getting ready to, to move. He felt like God was leading him into a different congregation. So we went to a, a church that he was considering the possibility of maybe becoming the lead pastor. And so he, my, uh, myself, and a, a friend of mine ended up at that church, and the church was in the build middle of a, like this building process, so none of the ceiling was up, there was no carpeting on the floors, it was just kind of a, a frame building, and, and we walked in, and my one friend was like, oh, his name, uh, his, uh, the pastor was heading, the door. his name was Hoffmaster, we used to call him Hoff, because he, he was mentoring us in ministry, and he said, man, Hoff, whoa, there's just all kinds of work. Man, man, I'm going, dude, this is going to be awesome. It just depends on how you see it. Almost 10 years ago, my wife and I bought a house, and in order to be able to buy the, in order to actually be actually really technically be able to go in it, you had to sign a waiver to be able to go into the house because they had mold in the house, and so they like had this, you know, because people are like freaked out. 
So I signed a waiver. We go into the house. We, and uh, what everybody else has thought, oh, my word, what a mess. I'm thinking, cha-chink. Paid $55,000 cash for the home, and now it's worth well over $200,000. I'm saying to you that you have to be able to perceive the opportunity. You have to be able to see what other people might consider to be an impossibility. God is placing in front of you as a huge opportunity by which you can magnify him, that God can promote you, that God can move you. Not only are you going to have to be able to see it, it takes perception, but it also takes preparation. Preparation is a readiness or the process of making something ready for use of service. Now, what I like about God, I shouldn't say it that way, one of the things I like about God is that God is amazing. He knows the end from the beginning. And long before I said to God, I believe in Jesus and I want him to be my, God had in mind what he wanted me to do. So God placed me in a home for which sometimes I think it was horrible. Dad was an alcoholic. My parents separated several times. I mean, it was a, it was a really ugly upbringing. But my dad uh, was a carpenter, and we did carpentry work. And all the time we were doing work on our house, I'm thinking, you know, I, not really comprehending. But because of everything that I experienced, it moved me and prepared me for what God had in our life. In 1982, when we felt, well, it was actually 1980, when we felt the call of the ministry. In 1982, church began to open up, and so we felt like God was calling us to, to lead pastor ministry, and we went to a particular church, and we were there, and uh, it was an old farmhouse. The church was very small. I think that we all met around a single eight-foot table for the interview, and I'll never forget we're there, and uh, my, the, the, the pulpit chairman said, well, I suppose I should show you the building next door. What he was referring to was the parsonage. The place was a wreck. And I just have to say to you that uh, I'm convinced that the reason I was there was not because I was so special. I was the only one that was willing to go. But I, we, were like, God has a plan. And because of the preparation, when I came to Tecumseh, when uh, we, we felt like God was asking us to come here. And I remember, I remember meeting with the deacon board. And I said, how in the world are you guys making your budget? Oh, we're doing great. We're making our budget. Became the lead pastor and discovered they hadn't made a full mortgage payment in over a year. I don't consider that making budget. All I'm trying to say to you is that in the midst of that, people were like, Oh, my word. I'm going, I believe God can do the impossible. Can perceive the fact God is preparing us. What I'm saying to you is you need to get prepared. David was prepared for Goliath because of the lion and the bear. David was prepared to be able to do what God had called him to do. Whitney Young Jr. said, it is better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared You will never join the ranks of the great in one day. You've got to get ready for that process. Remember when I felt like God was calling me to the ministry and we were uh, making our application for uh, ministry with the Assemblies of God. And uh, at that time there was a gentleman there whose name was Fred Smallchuck. And he is now gone to be with Jesus, but he was the secretary treasurer who was handling the credential process. And I remember going into his office because I had to come to this church actually to take my licensing exam. And I somehow missed the communication. And instead of being here, I had to go down to the district office. I went to the district office and I went into Fred Smallchuck's office. And I was just a young guy. I think at that time I was like 21. And uh, I'm sitting in his office and he looked at me and he said... Just because you're called doesn't mean you have the tools. You need the tools. And I thought, you old coot, what do you know? 
I'm just telling you, that's what I thought. Over the years, I've discovered the dude was a brain. Because just because I'm called doesn't mean I'm equipped. I've got to be prepared. I don't know what God's called you to. That recognizing that if God has called you to something, then get yourself ready for it. Alan Smith said this, life is full of opportunities. Some are easy to take advantage of. Some will be difficult. But once we let them pass, often in hopes of something better, remember the bull? Those opportunities may never again be available. Elisha was prepared by being with Elijah. And through that preparation, through that time, Elisha was ready to step in to be the prophet. The disciples were ready to take advantage of the day of Pentecost because Jesus had prepared them. They had been with him. And so when the day of Pentecost appeared, Peter stands up and preached. And because of their ministry, it spread throughout the globe. As a young missionary happened to be involved in his ordination interview at one time and we were talking and he said yeah I felt like God has called me to be a missionary and so I'm preparing myself for that I need to get my ordination so that I can be prepared and so we're in the midst of the discussion about doctrine and things of that nature but I said and so what what happened he said well you know when I was a young man before I was a teen I felt God called me to the mission field and so what I did was I got rid of my bed I got rid of my dresser and I got rid of everything in my bedroom. And I slept on the floor. My parents were like, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting prepared for the mission field. I'm saying, I don't know what God has called you to. But if you feel like God has placed something in front of you, then get prepared so that when the opportunity presents itself, you are ready to take full advantage of it. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. How can you give an answer for something you don't necessarily have an answer for? Sometimes people, well, you know, I, I believe, well, are you, re, are you a Bible reader? Well, you know, I don't spend time reading. Well, you need to develop and cultivate the habit of being a Bible reader. It ought to be this big amen. That was not a big amen, but at least there was a few. So, well, you know, how can I give an answer? You're not prepared. People, well, I, mean, I just don't know about sharing my faith. Well, why do you not know about sharing your faith? Well, I can tell you why you don't know and why you're not ready. It's because you didn't get prepared. You can't seize an opportunity you're not ready for. God is going to open up opportunities. God is going to bring opportunities in into our lives. People from time to time will go fill out a job application, maybe for their dream job, only to discover that they don't have the qualifications. It takes a degree. It takes experience. Amen. Because they're not prepared wise people prepare before the opportunity so they're ready james draper senior said an opportunity of a lifetime has to be grasped in the lifetime of the opportunity peter says it this way in first, in first peter chapter 4 verse 1 christ suffered in his body so get ready as a soldier does Prepare yourself to think in the same way Christ did. Do it because those who have suffered in their bodies are finished with sin. So first of all, you need to be able to perceive it. I've got to be able to see that it is an opportunity. Secondly, I need to be prepared to seize that opportunity. And then lastly, you need to be ready to perspire. What that means is you need to be ready to work. Very few things actually happen without Work. I know that work, and sometimes in the culture, is like kind of this dirty word. Can I just say to you, work is a good thing. God has called us to a work. And recognizing that if you're going to be able to seize and make the most of an opportunity or magnify that opportunity, you need to be ready to work to make it happen. I mentioned a few minutes ago, my wife and I purchased the house. So we purchased the house. We get a 30-yard dumpster, set a 30-yard dumpster out in the garage. And we worked. 
went to our first church, and it was an old farmhouse. I remember we had snow in the upstairs bedroom the first winter. You work. Matter of fact, every once in a while, I'll say to people, well, you really don't necessarily know much about ministry until you're bled for the church. What I mean by that is you're on a job somewhere. You're, you're helping the church do something, and you, know, you end up smashing your thumb with a hammer or cutting yourself or tearing yourself open. I'm saying that it takes work, and I'm just here to say to you, if you're going to get a degree, it's going to take work. If you're going to build a business, it's going to take work. If you're going to build a ministry, it's going to take work. If you're going to build a marriage, it's going to take work. If you're going to be able to have an impact on your kids, it's going to take work. Recognize everything. It's going to take work. Few things happen without it. Thomas Edison said this, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> the Jews had to leave Egypt to get to the promised land. They had to fight the battles in order to be able to push the enemy out so they could conquer. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. He said, work hard so you can can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Jude said this. In the third verse, the Message Bible, he says, Dear friends, I've dropped everything to write you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, begging that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and cherish. Again, a lot of times the reason why people have a constant debt load Because getting out of debt is work. If you have kids, you know as well as I do when you say to them, you know how, because I'll a lot of times ask kids, and there's a young kid who comes on Wednesdays, his parents don't come, and I I see him every Wednesday, or pretty much every Wednesday, he comes up and gives me a hug, and and, uh, he's in elementary school, and I virtually always ask him, how's school going? It's just going good. I said, how are your grades? Grades are going, part of the reason why I ask him this is because I want to encourage him to recognize it's going to take work. It's going to take work recognizing if you're going to be able to survive, if you're going to be able to make it, it's going to take work. If you're going to be able to optimize the opportunity, if you're going to expand and magnify, you've got to be willing to work. Don't wait, uh, as actually Orson uh, Martin said, don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Seize common occasions and make them great. Weak men wait for opportunities. Strong men make them. Paul said it this way, and we started with it. He said, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. To make the most of every opportunity, you need to be You need to be able to see it. First of all, if I can't see the opportunity, I'll never be able to seize it. And so one of the things we need to be praying for is, God, give me wisdom. Give me insight. Give me me discernment so I can understand the opportunities that are in front of me. So that when I'm at work, I'm at school, I'm at home, when I'm in the neighborhood, when I'm at church, when I'm in the sanctuary, I'm in the gymnasium, after, uh, after the service in Afterglow, or I'm interacting with my kids after I get them out, the children's ministry, and we're talking, I'm looking for the opportunity. I'm just sitting with my wife and I raised four kids, we have 11 grandkids, and I'm just here to tell you, whenever we get together, there's always an opportunity for me to talk to them about Jesus, always. There's always a teaching moment. Make the most of every opportunity because God wants us to make a difference in the world in which we live because through our God, we shall do valiantly. For it is he who treads down the enemy. The New Living Translation, with God's help, we will do mighty things. I, I believe that 2018 has the potential to be huge in our lives. I know I probably preached into oblivion, all right? But just hang with me for a second. I believe that 2018 has the potential to be huge in our lives. Okay, one more time. I believe that 2018 has the potential to be huge in our lives. 
And in order to be able to make the most of the opportunity, I've got to be able to perceive it. I've got to be able to see it out there. When, it, when God opens it up, I've got to be able to seize it. And I've got to be prepared. So that one of the best ways for me to be prepared to share my faith is to make sure my faith is intact. And I'm a Bible reader. I get into Bible study or I create a Bible study. And I'm sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Get into my, the element of education or wherever it might be. I get myself in a place where I can find the experience that I'm going to need so that when I go to make that application, I'm ready to take, take it on and recognize it's going to take work. And I know that, you know, because I'm just, I'm a human. I love it when people do stuff for me. But I also recognize that in order for it to happen, we have to be willing to work. When we're willing to work, we can see the opportunity, and we're prepared. God can do amazing things through us. Let's pray. God, thank you that we could be here today. And I'm praying and believing today that your word, Lord, is going to continue to bear fruit in our lives.